Now, ever since they start, stopped sending small boys up chimneys, the British have thought they were enlightened on the question of the exploitation of children. But a conference on child labour, which opened in Amsterdam today, is expected to upbraid Britain for our refusal to sign up to a European directive on child workers. There are thought to be two million children in Britain working, and laws do exist to limit the number of hours they can put in. But the European rules would be tighter. Sue Lloyd Roberts has been investigating what child labour means in Britain. The children of the Lancashire Dales may no longer work in the mills, but here, as elsewhere, Britain's hidden army of workers toils on. Six o'clock in the morning, and it's still dark in February. Most of us expect to find a newspaper and a pint of milk on the doorstep, not thinking how they got there. They've probably been delivered by children like these in the Rossendale Valley. But children aren't supposed to be out working before seven in the morning. It's against the law. And so is working later than seven at night. After school, 14-year-old Scott sits down with his family for tea. Good evening, Scott. You all ready for going now? <laughs> at 20 to seven, a neighboring farmer picks him up to take him the short distance to his farm. Scott helps milk the cows for one and a half hours every evening, seven days a week. He gets paid 15 pounds. But the law also requires that all child workers should be registered. Have you got a license to work? No, no. Do you know it's illegal to employ children after seven in the evening? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I don't know about that. For his part, Scott isn't much bothered with the rules either. Did you feel exploited? No, not at all. If I didn't want to come up, I won't come up. Well, I enjoy it. I'd do it if it didn't give me any money at all, because I don't like it. And his mother positively encourages him to work. Like, really, it keeps him off the streets. At least he's doing something well, responsible, isn't he, really? He's not wrecking bus shelters or pestering old ladies or whatever they get up to. It all sounds quite reasonable. Scott enjoys work, his mother approves, so does it matter if children like Scott and the boys on the paper rounds and the milk floats are illegally employed? How many of you work? Anything at all? Anything at all? You all work, right. Well, we Next morning at Scott School, the head teacher, Neil Thornley, takes a straw poll. You work at the golf course as a waitress, don't you, on the, on the odd evening? Occasionally, yeah. How, late, how, how long can you work in one stretch? Well, what I usually do, I work from about 6 until about 11. Right. Now, is that legal? No. 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 How long should she be able to, can she work for? No. It's four hours maximum, yes. There's a wide range of jobs here. Kurt delivers papers. Andrew helps in his mother's chip shop. And Sarah works in a shoe factory. But none of the children have work permits. Furthermore, working in a factory or in the preparation of food is strictly illegal. And what about schoolwork? Academic studies say paid work outside school has varying effects. Five hours a week or so can be beneficial. They actually seem to enhance uh, their educational performance. and We seem to give them greater access to the world of work, what knowledge of work. And, and in that sense, part of the general grown-up process. Between five and ten hours, it seems to be a sort of neutral period, so it doesn't do any harm. There's no obvious immediate benefits. But the evidence does tend to suggest that anybody who's working more than ten hours a week in combination with the, with, with schooling, uh, um, the, the effects are actually negative. The hours start to have a detrimental impact on school performance. With so many children working at this Lancashire school, what is the worst example the head teacher has come across? We had a young man about two or three years ago who worked for a roofing firm in the evenings and at weekends. And he worked all Friday night, uh, or Friday night in the summer anyway, uh, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and was dead on his feet on, on Monday and used, no use to anyone. With what result with his schoolwork? He failed everything. A recent report says there are over two million in Britain's so-called hidden army of child workers, of whom a quarter are under 12 and a third admit that their schoolwork suffers. 
If you calculate the number of hours that Britain's children are expected to spend at school, the number of hours the government want them to spend on their homework, and the number of hours paid work they're allowed to do, it adds up to a 60-hour week. The critics say something must give, and it should be the paid work. One way of resolving the conflict is not to go to school at all. 13-year-old Tom Hartley doesn't. Instead, he sells his father's luxury cars from their home-come showroom in South Derbyshire. The local education welfare officers know all about Tom. They check on his academic progress and social skills. To meet their demands, Tom studies English, maths, and cars. Now, you clearly know a lot about cars, Tom. About, what about the rest of your education? Do you worry that perhaps you don't know, know so much about geography, history, and so on? No, I, I think I do know quite a lot about the rest of education. Uh, as example, maybe psychology, um, communication, um, my business education. What about when you were 18, you suddenly decide you never want to see another car again? Haven't you closed your options a bit? No, no, not at all. I, d I don't think that will ever happen. But if it does, I have got my business skill which is like buying and selling, wheeling and dealing, whatever you want to call it, which uh, I can go on to do other things. Morning. Morning, Dad. Right, uh, man's given me some... Tom's sister, Priscilla, who's 15, took the same route. Their father explains that not going to school runs in the family. It's been a, a family tradition in the Hartleys, uh, not just me, my father, my father before his father, so on and so on for five generations, to my knowledge, and uh, none of us have suffered by it. You take a 14-year-old or 15-year-old and, 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 and ask them about uh, payments, uh, you know, ask half of them what a banker's draft is, they wouldn't know. Ask them what a chap's transfer is for a payment, they wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. I mean, my children are far from missing their education and I consider them to be very intelligent. Most children don't work to acquire such sophisticated skills and most don't have a rich father. For many, it's simply to acquire computers and designer gear. 14-year-old Andrew Richards worked for this minicab firm, which has since changed hands. Andrew left when the owner didn't pay his wages. With the help of a local law center, he took them to an industrial tribunal and won. But if Andrew and his mother's account of events is true, the employer was also in breach of child employment laws. On two occasions, uh, it was a Saturday and a Sunday, one after the other, I worked from half eight in the morning to half ten at night. And on school days? Uh, school days, um, because I used to get bullied, I used to train a lot and I used to go up there. And I was working from, say, 12 o'clock to half eight, half nine. The man who took Andrew on has since sold the business, but he agreed to meet us at his old office. Do you know the rules governing the employment of school-aged children in this afraid, country? No. So when he says he did work late hours and so on, you wouldn't have known it was illegal? No, no, he never did work late hours. Andrew phoned me up at 7 o'clock on a Saturday, and the first day he worked and said, I can't stop, they've got no one to relieve me. He said, I've got to stay on until someone else turns up. I said, what time's it going to be? He said, oh, probably 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock came, he phoned me again and said he couldn't come home, but when he did, George would be bringing him home. And twice George brought him down with his bike because it was after 10 o'clock at night when Andrew turned up home. He never worked after 7 o'clock. Never. Andrew says he worked 60 hours for you over a period of two or three weeks for which he was never paid. That is not true. Every time I'd gone for a job before, I'd been turned down. And this time I felt really good about myself. But now I know what really happens. I'm not so sure I want to start work yet. And I'm going around checking on whether people at school have got, got part-time jobs. Right. There are safeguards in Britain for child workers, child employment officers like Patty Hill, here inspecting restaurants in Solihull. Nothing wrong in these ones. But only 15 local authorities employ full-time child employment officers. Patty has 5,000 children registered to work in Solihull and believes there are as many working illegally, but it's well nigh impossible to keep track of them. She says it would help if employers cooperated. I work on the premise that employers know. There are 33 pieces of legislation already on the statute books, 
which relate to children, young people, the latest being the health and safety. And so, as far as I'm concerned, they know. But do they? We film children arriving at this news agents in Birmingham to start their paper rounds at six in the morning. I asked the manageress why she had the boys in so early. You lose track of time. You lose track of time. But that there are very strong regulations governing the employment of children in this country, and the seven o'clock rule is one of them. You knew of it. No, I didn't realize it. You didn't realize it was quite so early in the morning. Uh, what we have in Britain is a real mixture of legislations up and down the country, various local authorities working with different bylaws. The result is complete confu confusion amongst children, amongst employers, amongst trade unionists, amongst uh, educationalists and even amongst councillors. People don't know what the legal situation is. The European Commission is attempting to force Britain to adopt a directive which would clarify the legal position. Among other things, it would cut the number of hours the child could work from 20 to 12 hours a week. But child employment has been relegated to the list of opportunities for this government to indulge in Euro bashing. Stop telling us how many hours we're allowed to work. Stop telling kids they can't earn pocket money from doing their paper rounds. Stop telling small... So instead of adopting a national framework, the government is leaving it up to local authorities to incorporate the EU directive into their bylaws, should they wish. And the cash-strapped local authorities admit that child employment is low on their list of priorities. And those are obviously school attendance, children in employment and children in entertainment. And because of the vast increases with the work in schools and school attendance, truancy and such like, take priority. And the other two subjects have had to take a far lower place. With what result? with the result that there are a very, very large number of young people who are illegally employed out in the country and there is nothing being done about them. And they, they really are being exploited and put at risk. It is an abuse of children. Child labour in Britain may not exhibit the same problems as that in the third world, but if we can't enforce the law for simple things like paper rounds and milk deliveries, what would we do if children were found again working in the mills? That report was from Sue Lloyd Roberts. Most of the papers lead with the uh, Ministry of Defence's spectacular uh, cock up over the poisoning uh, in the Gulf by the use of organophosphates. There's the Sun, there's the Financial Times, there's the uh, Daily Telegraph, there's the Independent. Times leads on uh, Labour's uh, continuing lead in the polls. British Aerospace has warned of the dangers of European isolation and Fergie's move back in with Andrew, apparently, although only in the butler's flat. That's all from Newsnight tonight. Good night.